our keynote speaker. So I've known Anil for a couple of years now. Uh, I was very excited that he was willing to come here. Uh, he's done uh, he's done everything in computing. He's done hardware design, software design. He's done academic work, uh, great research. He's done hardware level programming, software architecture, uh, and has, has been able to always combine those into interesting um, combinations. So I'm very excited to have him here today to know about Unikernels, which combines a lot of the things that he's been doing. Uh, don't worry about pronouncing his last name. Yes. Right. One, two, three. One, two, three. That's about right. Perfect. So I wanted to talk to you about a project that uh, uh, let me just turn this down a little bit, a little bit too high. Um, I wanted to talk to you about a project that we've been working on for over five years now, and um, it's a new way of building operating system kernels. And uh, the spoiler is that it's all using functional programming. So I have, I will have a mix of systems and uh, programming uh, during this talk. Now, just to give me a sense, how many people here have done some functional programming in the past? Perfect. How many of you have done OCaml? Uh, okay, this is good. So you, you know the concepts, and uh, this, is, this will be fun. Uh, and of course, uh, the work that I'm talking about has been done by a lot of people. This is part of quite a large Linux uh, Foundation incubator project now. So I'll, I'm just a spokesman for uh, quite, a, quite a large project. Now, all of the, uh, the work that I'm talking about today is actually self-hosted. So this presentation is being served, um, I will very carefully lift it off a little board here, and it's written uh, in a unikernel that's being served as a website. And the entire kernel is about two and a half megabytes in size, and this includes uh, a complete operating system that is uh, booting up, uh, it's serving slides in HTTP, uh, it's got device drivers and a network stack, and it's written completely in OCaml. So the idea is that uh, you build completely safe operating systems that can uh, perform useful work, uh, if you think this talk is useful, and uh, it, it, can, um, it can be a very flexible way of deploying services. And in addition to being written like this, it's also quite simple to use. So the goal is not to make all of the functional programmers here into kernel programmers, but to make it easy for you to write high-level code uh, and to come up with a website. And it's also part of uh, our longer-term uh, vision that uh, to break up the big cloud in the middle of the uh, internet right now into a much smaller, uh, more manageable set of devices that run closer to, uh, closer to us. So the idea is that this system here um, is actually running Zen, which is a, a hypervisor that now runs on ARM as well. Uh, and the resulting workflow, all of the things that we deploy, are so small that they can run directly inside Git. So not just the source code, but also the entire operating system outputs can be tracked using version control. So I'll show you all of this uh, during the talk. And just so you can see what the board looks like uh, in, for bare metal, um, the entire uh, hardware for the talk, except for the very expensive Mac, um, is actually on the, the small PB board there. And the interesting thing is how uh, easy it is to buy these commodity ARM devices now. So this QB board here is 39 pounds, and uh, it has a gigabyte of RAM, two cores, and it's very, very um, uh, easy to get off the shelf. So this is something that uh, anyone can deploy and try out uh, uh, later on. So just to step back, uh, why do we want to rebuild operating systems in the first place? Uh, one of the very key tenets in any kind of programming that we do is that we want to build small, well-defined uh, modules, and we want to combine them together uh, and build bigger systems that have understandable behavior. This is incredibly hard to do in distributed systems. The reason for this is, uh, is, is because the way that we program has changed dramatically in the last 20 years. So originally, uh, whenever I started programming, uh, we'd be building a, server, a bit of server software, a bit of client software, some embedded systems, and uh, you know exactly what you're building for. These days, uh, I'm a <coughs> university professor, so I teach students, and I feel very sorry for them. Because whenever they go into the world and they start programming, they have to deal with all kinds of different systems that have extremely different properties. So you see that uh, we now have to build cloud services where uh, traffic spikes and overcommit will just cause your service to fail. Uh, you have to work with smartphones, with uh, strange APIs and restrictions. Uh, we have to build systems in JavaScript uh, that form entire uh, complex applications. And uh, there's very little code reuse between any of these systems. So we wanted to explore, is there a way that we can use functional programming 
to let us build uh, systems that can reuse and map to all of these environments uh, simultaneously and go back to that original dream of writing one bit of source code and trying to map it onto uh, very uh, many exotic environments. And the other thing that really drove this was um, in the last uh, 10 years, we've seen these beautiful devices being built by many people, everything from uh, your, your home thermostats to uh, you can have a weight scale that tweaks your weight. Uh, I'm not sure why you would do that, but uh, it's uh, apparently a very popular weight scale these days. And it's shocking just how bad the state of security is in these devices. So we've gone from uh, this, this very, very nice industrial design uh, to just catastrophes because the software that runs on these, uh, on these uh, devices, despite them being very small, um, is extremely insecure and, and composed of many legacy uh, bits of software all glued together. And so if you look at the high speed attacks, 17% of all hosts were vulnerable. Shell shock uh, is a, a problem that will never be fixed in our generation because there are so many devices deployed that have uh, uh, this code uh, embedded in them that we just have lost track of. And every time this happens, hundreds of millions of people uh, have their personal data leaked. So a more secure, simpler way of programming is something that uh, would be very nice to have indeed. And the reason for, uh, for doing all of this is uh, to eliminate complexity and make things simpler again. So functional programming has an aura of complexity sometimes. Uh, that uh, it's all to do with complicated mathematics and putting things uh, together in very cunning ways. But the reality is that functional programming simplifies your overall system construction. And I'll explain that uh, with showing you how Mirage is constructed. Uh, because right now, applications are built with um, a lot of links tying them together. So whenever we build applications to a modern uh, Linux or Windows API, we're dealing with 20 or 30 years of uh, backwards compatibility that has to be enforced. And modern operating systems do everything. Your Linux will run on your TV, it will run on your computer, it will run on your smartphone, and it runs on embedded devices. And it, it offers features that many of these deployments do not need. So our goal is to try to figure out how do we get rid of all of this unbounded interaction um, as, uh, as, uh, in a structured and safe way as possible. And the really weird thing is that we spend all of this time in functional programming, but we then surround our functional programs, our Haskell code or our Camel code, with 15 million lines of kernel code that is just unsafe and is the first thing that uh, looks at your network traffic. So it's a bit strange, right? We, we build a very safe uh, thing on the inside, but meanwhile the outside is getting attacked and uh, overflowed and none of our uh, abstractions hold. So if functional programming can live up to the hype, if it can really be used to, to build these safe systems, why has the operating system not disappeared completely from the software stack? So, the, the specific things we want to fix are that whenever you deploy a cloud service now, uh, configuration management is very complicated. Uh, the, the number of uh, duplicated bits of functionality lead to a lot of inefficiency, so it's, it's quite slow as well. And we just want to fix uh, our attack service to make it uh, much, much easier to, uh, to, to uh, build and support these things in the long term. So we do not want to be updating these every, every five minutes, that whenever the next heartbeat uh, comes out. So how many people here have used uh, Docker uh, as an example? So yeah, about half of the room. So Docker is a wonderful in initiative. So what Docker does is that it, it tries to solve many of the same problems. Because what it does is that it takes your operating system stack. So it takes a stack uh, with your normal kernel processes and your configuration files. And it gives a beautiful user interface where it will wrap it up into a big shipping container. And then it will put that on, um, on, uh, onto a container and then you can manipulate this as if it was just one unit. And Docker has solved many of the problems that operating system virtualization uh, created because we now have many, many different ways of deploying systems and we need a simpler way. Unfortunately, what it doesn't do is to eliminate a lot of the complexity from the runtime. So whenever you use a Docker image, despite the fact that it's very simple to use, the 50 million lines of code is still contained within the container. And what we want to do is to get rid of that code entirely and to uh, make the thing that we deploy on, on the ARM device on the cloud extremely small. So we don't just want to hide the complexity, uh, we also want to eliminate the complexity where, where possible. And this is the key difference. So this is what uh, we do with unikernels. And so what we do is we take operating system functionality, we take the, um, everything that Linux or FreeBSD or Windows does, and we break it up into many, many libraries that implement independent bits of functionality. So your device drivers for the network, for storage, uh, your TCP IP stack, 
uh, your scheduler, all of them are become libraries. And whenever we build an application, we build only the functionality that the application needs. If you do not require an OpenGL stack, you do not link the 3D device drivers. If you uh, do not require TCP, if you're only building a storage system, then you do not link the entire networking subsystem. And by using this uh, flexibility, we can also link alternative uh, exotic platforms such as JavaScript from the single code base. So this, this uh, breaking up in a structured way of operating system functionality uh, uses functional programming and enables a whole bunch of new features as well. And I'll describe how, how we do that in, uh, in more detail. So unikernels are this intuition that for many applications, you want to specialize them to only do one thing. So if I'm a web server, I do not need it to have all of the functionality. I want it to be a web server. So to do this, we construct specialized VM images uh, that are compiled not just from the source code of the application, they also link in the operating system, and they uh, also get all of the configuration files required to build that appliance. So instead of just compiling uh, an Ubuntu image with uh, the core kernel and the binaries, we take all of the configuration available, such as the, uh, the port you're running on, the set of web pages, and so on, and we compile everything in one go. And in return, this requires rewriting all of your applications uh, in a new style for now, uh, because we wanted to explore what the benefits are if you do not focus on backwards compatibility. So in the Zen project, I, I was one of the original members of uh, the Zen project. Uh, we spent a decade making sure that everything is 100% compatible. So when you run your Windows uh, virtual machine on Zen, it will always work as if it was running on physical hardware. With this approach, we took a 180 degree turn. We said, uh, we only want to run specialized systems on this thing, and what are the benefits versus maintaining backwards compatibility? And in return, we found just incredible uh, benefits. Uh, everything inside a unikernel is completely self-contained. Uh, you do not require, in a lot of cases, the complex APIs. Uh, it's very compact, and uh, it's much more efficient than normal uh, big kernel running in the cloud. We can actually run tens of thousands of kernels on a single host. Uh, and even on a small device like this ARM, we can run hundreds of unikernels, uh, where previously you could run maybe uh, two or three. So how does this work? We know that uh, we do not want to, to turn all functional programmers into operating system hackers. And so this means that um, ideally what we want to do is we want to analyze the source code that you write, and we want to figure out uh, how much of it we can specialize into operating system code. And we do this in a nice staged way. So whenever you write code, uh, you do not have to worry about Zen at all. You first of all write your high-level source code uh, using Unix, uh, or a Mac, or, or, or Windows, which will uh, not support it yet, but it will eventually be supported. And uh, the compiler will take care of analyzing it and making sure that everything runs uh, as a normal Unix binary. So eventually, whenever you, uh, you finish writing this, uh, this bit of uh, Unix code, you want to start slowly removing Unix functionality. So take, for example, one of the biggest bits of uh, functionality, the network stack. It's an extremely complicated uh, part of kernel code. And then Mirage will just say, uh, we will replace the network stack, still in Unix, uh, with a version that will run in user space, and it will let you move into the Mirage land. And when you're finished testing that, you can then go off and just recompile again, and everything will be uh, uh, updated and, uh, and uh, be running on Zen. So the, the user interface is start developing in Unix, and then slowly remove the dependency on operating system, and eventually you end up with the Zen uh, Unix kernel. And I'll show you a demonstration of that uh, shortly. The reason this is possible is because um, in our operating system, we do not need to support a huge hardware interface. Instead, the hardware is virtual hardware that is provided by Zen. And this means that any operating system that comes along does not need to support um, all of the varieties of hardware that we provide. Instead, we depend on Zen, which is very widely deployed now, um, to just give us virtual networking, virtual storage, and th that's why Mirage has stayed working for a long time. In the past, when you built experimental operating systems, you don't have device drivers, and uh, that's it. It becomes obsolete within uh, less than a year, often. But Mirage has been running for five years now using exactly the same Zen hardware interface. So this is why uh, it's a beautiful way to experiment with new operating system abstractions, even something as uh, weird as running in a, um, uh, in, a, in, a, in a functional language. And just to give you a sense, I won't go into detail about this, but the final specialized output uh, that's running in Zen is extremely specialized. 
So it's so specialized that it does not even have a concept of a process. Instead, it runs in a single address space in memory. This means that the only thing that the unikernel does from an operating system perspective is to run or camel code. And to do that, it, it maintains a static memory map that gives a specific area of memory where anything runs. For example, uh, the text and data segment, which is the, uh, the compiled unikernel that sits at the top of memory, all of the foreign uh, data that is being read from the network sits in a very special part of memory with the foreign grants, and then all of the OCaml code sits uh, on, the, uh, on the other end. This means that many things are simplified. Uh, you don't have to deal with uh, Linux's address-based randomization and many of the security features, because they're simply unnecessary in this world. We've sealed all of our code into one address space and deployed that. So to give you a sense of how easy it is, um, I'll just show you uh, this running on uh, the onboard. So first of all, we simply do garage configure, uh, uh, configuration file in Unix. And then whenever you've debugged it, uh, I, I won't show you this in too much detail. I, I can give you demonstrations afterwards. You will then uh, compile and debug it uh, under Unix as normally. And then uh, you simply have to re recompile it using Zen. So if I switch here to Zen, this is uh, a console running on this ARM board. And I will just prove that it's running Zen. Uh, if you see here, it's running a domain zero that's using up half a gigabyte of RAM with two vCPUs. And if I look at the D message, uh, this is just showing you that it's Zen 4.4, you can see here that it's actually running an ARM processor. So this is now a full virtual environment running on ARM. Uh, this is a, a pretty new feature of Zen. So then I could go to my, I want to uh, just create a static website. And I could just go to, uh, for example, my static website directory here, and I can go to HD Docs, and here I'm saying hello about world. Let's make it more exciting. So at this point, I want to build a unikernel. I can simply do mirage configure minus minus zen. And what it does is that it takes care of um, doing everything it needs to satisfy this one uh, application. So in this case, it requires uh, the web library. So it is installing all of the web libraries. You can see here HTTP uh, and all the Zen libraries and so on. And then it generates some ML code. And this, uh, if you're not familiar with ML, don't worry. But this is a pretty standard way of building these kind of websites. Uh, we just write ML code to do URL handling and so on and so forth. Uh, and it's a pretty small, small bit of code. And then you just type in make. And at this point, I've not written a line of C code. I've only written ML code. And um, the resulting compilation results in a very small kernel. So this is just uh, giving me a build. And instead of building an ELF binary, it's just gone ahead and built a full standalone kernel. So imagine your compiler, instead of stopping with an executable, continues to compile and results in uh, a full kernel. So in this case, we can see it's 1.7 uh, megabytes. And uh, I can run this just by uh, going to my Zen configuration file, and I just give it a network interface. So it's got a virtual interface. And you know, it's got 256 megabytes of RAM. That's a lot of RAM. I, I don't need to give it that much. It's a unikernel, so I can reduce that to just 16 or less. Uh, 16 is a, is, is a safe number. And at this point, you can just run uh, the actual unikernel. And this is a fully type-safe stack that is uh, obtaining its IP address. And it is going off and uh, serving traffic. So it really was simple uh, to construct a, a kernel without writing any lines of code, just by using the unikernel uh, build framework. So how does, how does all this work behind the scenes? Um, and this is the reason why we did everything in OCaml. Uh, and it's actually something that uh, differentiates OCaml from Haskell in quite a big way. So ML's defining feature uh, is, first of all, is type inference. So that it, it's obviously based on the, the beautiful Hindley Miller type inference algorithm. But the second thing is that it's got a module system that is one of the most comprehensive module systems in, in any language. And so in Mirage, every single device driver is built as a module. And by what this means is that there's two things that exist. The first one is that every device driver is built as a module type. And a module type is the shape of something. It's what a network stack is or what, a, uh, what it means to be an HTTP server. And it describes all of the types and things that need to happen to support that. And the second thing is that to fill those shapes in, we implement a lot of libraries that implement that functionality. Uh, and the result of doing this, just defining some shapes and filling the shapes in, is what Mirage is. That's all. It's just a way of uh, organizing your source code um, to fit in these abstractions. 
So just to give you a, a sense of what this is called, in, in Haskell, because so many of you have done Haskell, functors are completely different from the functors I'm going to be talking about here in, in OCaml. This is one of the, the big points of confusion. In functor, it's a type class that lets you map uh, functions across a parameterized type using fmap. Um, in OCaml, it's a similar concept, except that instead of being parameterized across um, some type, you can have a collection of functions and types that form a complete module. And an OCaml functor is simply a module that depends on another module implementation. So this is an extremely powerful feature that lets you take large bits of source code, package them, and depend on some other bit of uh, source code collection in order to implement uh, some functionality. And functors and modules in ML are a different language from the core ML. Uh, it's interesting that there's two languages that have been combined into one, uh, and one of them is very succinct and uh, compact, the core language, and modules are quite uh, syntactically uh, verbose. So in, in Mirage, we use modules everywhere. We use them for the whole application. Uh, we have modules, uh, for thousands of modules that build, for example, the network stack, uh, including TLS. Uh, and it's extremely flexible. You, you mean you can take a small bit of functionality such as HTTP, and you don't have to pull in the whole of the operating system uh, you know, through sockets and so on to support it. And the result of this is that we have many, many implementations of signatures. So if I have a signature for uh, something like um, HTTP, we can compile this code into not just Xen and Unix, but also JavaScript and kernel modules, and lots of uh, environments where you can control exactly what you need to, uh, what you need to build. So let me give you a quick example through some uh, OCaml source code. Uh, I have, don't have a lot of OCaml, but I just wanted to give you a sense of what these look like. So when you define these interfaces, um, you define some very simple standalone concepts. In this case, I'm saying that we have a module type for a device driver. And a device driver does very few things. It, first of all, ha often has to do I.O. So this is saying that we have some abstract way of doing I.O. that can block. And uh, it can, any I.O. function can return an arbitrary type. And then we have some state for the device driver, and we have some ident identity function. So whenever you have any device, we simply want it to be able to give it an ID. We want to connect to it and either return an error or return some state. And this might block. This is very simple. This is saying that any device driver, such as a network uh, device driver, should be able to fit this state. But nothing is constraining it to be just low-level device drivers. We can also define an HTTP stack that is a device driver simply by defining what it means to connect an HTTP stack to, uh, to the rest of the operating system. So we've immediately uh, provided one overarching abstraction. Then you can get a little bit more complicated. You can say that uh, we also have a number of things that do flows. And these flows are uh, things that will uh, be able to communicate over the network. So we again have I.O. and we have some notion of buffers. Um, and we want to say that uh, every time you have a flow you want to read, and this might, uh, given a flow, return a buffer or an error or the end of the file, and you want to block, and so on and so forth. You can read and write. And the device driver and flow are completely independent. We just define these two notions of shapes that we have to, uh, we have to match. But then, sometimes you want to combine them. So if you have a TCP stack, uh, again written in ML, now we have, um, TCP is obviously much more complicated. We have the notion of a buffer. We have the notion of some underlying device like IPv4. Um, and we can now include the previous signatures we just defined. We can say that uh, we want to include the device uh, interface, and we want to include the flow interface. So now we have TCP as a device driver. That implements flow as well. And you can start to see how the shape of this thing kind of flows out uh, in the operating system. And the module system lets you do some very cool things like type equalities, where uh, this is more if you're, um, if you're, uh, you're going to ML. But we can say that um, for, for the system, um, the device uh, fuses its abstract ID to the ID of the IPv4. So we're forming a connection. And simply, whenever you have the network flow, we're saying that the type of the network flow's I.O. is exactly the same as the type of the device's I.O. So these are forming type equalities that force the system to, to make sense as you, as you compose it together. Now these module types are used. We have hundreds of these module types all the way through Mirage. They're small, structural, independent things. And the value of them becomes obvious when you do security critical things. So for example, uh, building a TLS stack, which it re the whole of SSL, uh, done by uh, uh, two chaps, one from, uh, in fact, from Berlin, Hannes Menhardt, then David Kalper. 
And uh, in order to build this entropy stack, it was extremely uh, security critical that we got entropy correct. And it turns out that entropy is very hard to do, just getting random numbers in a virtual environment. And so there's many different ways of doing it. And we managed to, after uh, quite a lot of uh, uh, thinking and iteration, come up with a very simple interface that says that we have defined a higher order function called a handler that given a source with some ordering will give you some entropy. And this module type, although it looks very simple, maps onto all of the ways of getting entropy inside uh, Linux and inside Zen and so on and so forth. So we can build very complex uh, device driver models with the minimum interface that we need just for that one bit of functionality. And this standalone composable aspect is extremely important uh, for the whole thing. So once we have these shapes, uh, and uh, I can show you some of these shapes in person then afterwards, we actually want to build a component. And then what the component does is that um, it defines code that implements that one component. But the critical uh, feature is that when it needs something from the outside world, it doesn't just use Unix. What it does is that it parameterizes itself across the functionality that it requires. So if, um, for example, I'm an HTTP stack and I need a TCP stack, I will not depend on one. I will just make that a, a functor that depends on that uh, bit of functionality. And so we use functors, the ML functors, to separate and become our device driver stack in the operating system. And this is how Mirage fits all of its, uh, its bits and pieces together. So let me give you an example of how it worked in this, uh, in this, um, in this uh, uh, example of the website that I showed you. Well, the first thing you do is that uh, we wanted to define a home page. And this home page um, is, in this case, an application. And the application depends on an HTTP stack. And then this HTTP stack uh, itself depends on a TCP stack because it has to serve network traffic. But in this case, uh, we, we're running on Unix. So it, it, TCP is provided by Unix sockets, which depends on the Unix kernel. So this is a, how a normal application is built. If you build a Haskell app or a Camel app, this looks no different from that. But then we want to replace the need. Our goal is to get rid of Unix. So we will then start testing it by eliminating the need for sockets by putting in a user space uh, networking stack. And what this does is that it, instead of TCP, it provides an Ethernet interface. And the Ethernet interface will uh, go in from the Linux kernel and will get a, uh, using something called TomTap, and get user space networking. So at this point, we've sliced away half of our, um, our uh, operating system, but not all of it. But then you can say, I want to get rid of Unix completely. And to get rid of Unix, the Ethernet device is provided directly by Zen, and all of the device drivers um, uh, are provided through the, the Zen network stack. So what we've done here is we've provided three different ways of compiling the same module. So we have the home page uh, application, and any one of these arrows will satisfy one of the hardware targets. And this abstraction provided by functional programming is all you need in order to make this, uh, make this possible. And crucially, the person writing the code has no idea which of these paths is being taken. It's all provided by Mirage automatically. So this is similar to when you configure your Linux kernel. You go through the, the crazy makefile uh, system that I can never quite figure out after 20 years of using Linux. But the, the essence of it is exactly what we do here, except we do it with, uh, with types. So you can actually do this in a much more uh, structured way. And to give you a sense of what it looks like, you only have to add two lines to your camel code to turn it into a unikernel. So here we've, de we've defined our uh, dispatch function, which is a fragment uh, I, I just demonstrated to you. And we've abstracted it by creating a module main. And what the module main does is that it is provided abstract consoles, abstract file systems, and an abstract HTTP. Instead of assuming that one of these exists, it just becomes a functor across this, uh, this functionality, and then it uh, implements that, that particular behavior. So this abstraction means that you can lift your applications into this uh, domain of uh, unikernels. The problem is that functors are quite heavyweight. So in order to uh, lift all of your applications up, anytime you need a little bit of quick functionality, you have to provide a big functor, and it's quite a heavyweight way of programming. So what we did was we actually built a configuration language in Mirage that automates all of these choices. And what these choices do is that um, they essentially let you emit functors automatically, so you don't have to worry about uh, a lot of the details. Now, I'm not going to show you the details of the EDSL. I can show you that later on. I wanted to show you the essence of, um, of, uh, of what it does. And so in order to define my web server, I'm defining my, uh, my uh, this is the, the site I'm showing you. I'm saying that we will define uh, the configuration for an HTTP server. 
An HTTP server will listen on TCP port 80, and it has a, a conduit that, will, uh, uh, that is a network uh, uh, device. And then we will apply that to a particular module called dispatch. So what happens here is that this configuration fragment um, is not, it's not like running an Apache uh, configuration file. It's OCaml code that executes whenever you compile the application, and it figures out exactly what you want. And then what it does is that it um, enforces an equivalence. It supplies the concrete implementations of this uh, abstraction that you uh, built your app around. So let's say that I uh, built this application code, uh, and I'm running it on Unix. So in this case, we need to supply an implementation of a console, of a key value store, and of an HTTP server. And ideally, we should do that automatically, because we know we're running on Unix. So what Mirage does is that it generates um, automatically for you a module stack. This module stack looks very simple. It says that um, I will define for you a notion of an, a, a network stack, and this is a TCP IP socket. And then this conduit stack will, uh, will from that uh, uh, TCP IP stack, construct a conduit. Then my HTTP stack will, from the conduit, generate a conduit. And then eventually, we will uh, create an executable version of our application. And this is a Unix unicorn. Uh, this is all automatically generated. Um, and it makes it look exactly like a normal Unix binary. It uses kernel sockets. You can run inside Docker or anything else. And uh, this is just how you normally write code. Except, when we recompile it to run into Zen, this thing automatically changes and suddenly becomes more interesting. This network stack that we, we defined before is no longer based on sockets. The network stack is now um, defined as an Ethernet stack that is made from a network interface. We then make an IP stack from that. We also make a UDP stack from the IP. We can then make a TCP stack from the combination of IP and UDP. So you can see how this composition is kind of falling together. But the important thing is that at the end of this definition of the, the, the stack module, everything else is exactly the same. We've abstracted just the network stack, and we can replace that with a full implementation. So we've gone from uh, Unix kernel sockets to a full implementation right here. So that is the, the essence of the flexibility. The module systems that are generated can insert just the right bit of functionality you need for the application. And is this worth all the trouble? Well, any of these unikernels can now be deployed in all kinds of configurations, completely automatically. We can, we can build them with the data in, uh, in the image. Uh, we can build the unikernels uh, with data read, read from disk. We can build Unix binaries. Essentially, anywhere you want to deploy a service, you can, you, can deploy, um, you, you can build a configuration fragment that does this. So consider the number of times you've wanted to just change uh, the disk scheduler in a database. In Mirage, you supply it with just a different configuration file, and it will link in a completely custom scheduler for your application. All of these things are entirely possible now. So after all of this, was it really worth all of the trouble? Um, the result of um, all of this optimization is that we can build these unikernels that are extremely small. So in, in this case, uh, in the case of DNS, for example, um, we built unikernels that are 200 kilobytes in size. And they get smaller and smaller because we depend on the compiler to do all of the optimization. So in this case, we give OCaml, uh, the native code compiler, all of the source files, all of the configuration files, and it takes care of eliminating all of the, all of the uh, redundant source code it doesn't need. So in this case, by adding dead code elimination, we got it down to um, 180 kilobytes in size. And this is a fully functional DNS server that can serve, for example, root name server traffic that's completely type safe end to end. The other interesting thing is how quickly these things boot. So these things boot um, in real time. So whenever we, we build one of these, uh, these kernels, if you take a, this is the amount of time it takes to boot and uh, start serving network traffic. And this is um, a, a very optimized Linux kernel with a custom init root, everything we could do to make it as fast as possible. And it still takes half a second to boot. With unit kernels, um, because they do almost nothing else, uh, the booting is instantaneous. It's milliseconds. And this implies one interesting fact. This means that we can actually boot and respond to traffic in real time. So if it takes 10 milliseconds to respond to traffic, um, I could be not running, I could receive a TCP packet, I could boot, and I could respond to it without anyone ever noticing. And this is the difference between one second and 10 milliseconds. The fact that you can just completely suspend your operations. The other interesting thing is that we wanted to figure out if you can get this fast as well. And so VeriSign um, uh, uh, gave us a, a, a grant in order to build a DNS server that is hopefully the best DNS server that we've built. And it was interesting. 
So if you look at BIND and NSV, uh, are people here familiar with DNS? So who's, uh, oh, I see, okay. So BIND and NSV are uh, name servers that run a lot of the internet's name, name architecture. And so we wanted to figure out, based on the number of DNS entries, um, how performant can we make uh, a unikernel. So BIND and NSV are both quite fast. The, the higher, the better in this graph. So we rebuilt uh, our, our system using unikernels, and the yellow graph shows our performance by default. And you can see it's a little disappointing because we're completely type safe. So both uh, BIND has had a number of security holes, and we're doing uh, full security checks all the way through. Uh, but we're still slower, and ultimately people only really care about speed. But this is where the essence of functional programming came through. So we observed that uh, when the unikernel was being uh, profiled, it was doing a lot of repeated work. And in functional programming, we can memoize the, uh, uh, the, the, a function with the same arguments and reuse the result. And it turns out that when you do network processing, this happens a lot. Building a DNS packet is very, very uh, repetitive and uh, repeatable. So we added uh, about four lines of code, and then we managed to get this to become the fastest DNS server in the world uh, just by not doing any work. Because every time uh, the, uh, the full internet data set comes in, it obeys a power law that uh, means that uh, for every four or five packets, we can repeat the work. And this shows the real benefits of unikernels. It's not just about straight line performance by staring at code and doing assembly language optimizations. It's about looking at the algorithms that build your entire system and making sure that those are um, as smart as possible. And we can do this because um, as a human, I can look into just the part of code that is in the critical path. I'm not distracted by 20 million lines of kernel code and I, I can find the essence of the problem. And we've done this again and again in real deployments of, uh, of Mirage. So we, don't, we try not to make code uh, that is fast by tweaks. We try to make code that is uh, fast by construction, and, uh, and then everything else will, uh, will hopefully fall into place. So there's also one other trick that's, that's quite fun, and this is something that we've done just in the, last, uh, in the last few months. And I told you that our dream was to build uh, these ARM devices that are running everywhere. They're running around you in your homes, in your cars, they're owned by you, and they're extremely safe because they're all written um, in this end-to-end -end, uh, type-safe manner. And we've also seen that the performance is good. So there's really no downsides, except that you have to learn to build them in this style. But you really want to uh, figure out how do we move people away from the cloud. And the problem right now is that if you want to access the cloud, it's very simple to access. You go to google.com, and it's just there. But the problem is, you know, if I want to use a cloud service, hello, uh, uh, Berlin, what time is it? Can't be bothered. Um, it takes seconds. So we want our computers to be responding in milliseconds to our, uh, to our requests. So fundamentally, the only way to do this is by moving the computation in the cloud to the data. Because I can do the voice processing on the phone, except right now it's being shipped out to Apple. So how do we make it so that it's as simple to run unikernels locally so we can run all of the computation right here beside us? And at the same time, we want to make sure we're immune to all of these crazy security exploits. And so we rebuilt the entire Zen tool stack in a way um, that lets it do exactly this. And this is called Jitsu. And it's a just-in-time summoning of unikernels. So what this does is that um, it makes unikernels as quick to launch as Unix processes are today on, on a normal Unix system. And we had to do this through, uh, there's just tons of hacks under the scene that I won't go into, but it fundamentally involved rewriting the way that Zen handles uh, virtual machines. And there's a, um, I'll just show you the architecture to give you a sense of what it is. And this box here running um, is now uh, running in such a way that it's running Zen. And it can run legacy virtual machines such as Linux, running WordPress, that might have a lot of security holes. But the goal of the system is to make sure that no network traffic from the outside world is ever observed by Linux. Everything it sees is, is scrubbed through a unikernel. So all of the traffic coming in from Wi-Fi, from your Ethernet, all goes through unikernels um, that, are, that are completely type safe. And we provide very efficient shared memory transports that proxy the connections into the, uh, the other virtual machines. So this way, we can have unikernels running on the, uh, on the edge of the network that are responding really, really fast uh, to, to traffic. So uh, I won't go into the, 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 the details of the system. I'm ha very happy to talk about that afterwards. But there's one, one nice thing, which is the interface of Jitsu. And what Jitsu does is that it performs the role of INETD, or SystemD, or LaunchD on, on a Mac. And so whenever we uh, publish a, a, a unikernel now, 
I can say uh, this unit kernel is the homepage for anil.recode.org. And uh, it will take over the DNS, and it will do everything required. So whenever a DNS request comes in, it will proxy all of the connections uh, in such a way that uh, it can respond and boot a unit kernel in response to a particular net network, network traffic. If the unit kernel is not running, no problem. It boots in real time, it serves a request, and then it destroys it. Doing this in practice is quite complicated because um, we got unikernel booting fast, but we got it to 20 milliseconds. 20 milliseconds is, is pretty good, right? The problem is, if I respond to a DNS request from you, and Michael here on Wi-Fi would be uh, one millisecond away from me. So if the unikernel has not booted in those 20 milliseconds, we're going to lose some, uh, some packets, and then it will look like uh, you know, the, the service is not running. We want to make it so that this service always runs. And so what Jitsu does is it, it does a lot of cunning tricks in order to completely mask the boot latency. So uh, it, this looks scary, but it's relatively simple. We take a DNS query coming in from the client, and then Jitsu begins a complicated process of booting the unikernel. So behind the scenes, uh, it's launching the domain building, the unikernels, and so on. And then behind what it's doing is that if, if the client, while the VM, VM is booting, comes in with a connection request, it buffers it in something called Sinjitsu. And what the buffering uh, uh, proxy does is that it, it takes in all of the requests, it finishes the connection handshaking, and as soon as Unikernel boots, it tells it everything that was, that was happening. So the Sinjitsu proxy is half of a Unikernel with just a connection handling half, and then the other half is, um, is all of the stuff required to, to hand it off to the other Unikernel. So we can, we can split up our kernel so that a tiny portion is running that is handling TCP or handling SSL and handing it off to other systems. Now consider the case of SSL. This is incredibly useful. Because we can build a Sinjitsu proxy that has your private keys. It can handle all of the connection handling. And it can hand off the uh, session keys, the resulting state, to a unikernel that has no idea what your private key is. And so this means that we can do a privilege separation in, in quite an interesting way. And the end result of all of this parallelization is that you have an unmodified client doing DNS, TCP, HTTP that is just getting traffic uh, from one of these arm boxes. If it fails to boot, it can just hand it off to the cloud as well. So it's got a nice, uh, nice story there for, for pulling that off. Now, I mentioned that uh, we can do all of these. We can do coordination and orchestration. Uh, but since we started this project, almost everyone in Cambridge has bought one of these uh, QB boards. So we have uh, 50 QB boards sitting in people's houses and so on. And we wanted to track all of the infrastructure around it to build a community cloud so that uh, we can somehow uh, track all of these systems and make it uh, quite easy to use uh, and uh, deploy our friends' websites. So we're functional programmers, right? So what is one of the most functional ways of doing this? And the answer is to use persistent data structures, such as Git, to track our infrastructure. And these unicorns are so small that this is not a problem at all. And we've been doing this for four years on the Mirage website. So let me show you an example. Um, every time we, we go to the, um, uh, the Mirage, we push uh, some source code. Uh, this is me uh, pushing our weekly call notes. Uh, it's built using a site called Travis, which is developed here in Berlin. It's one of my favorite, favorite startups in, uh, in, in the last couple of years. What Travis does is that it uh, automatically builds the entire website from scratch um, every single time you do a push. And then it takes the resulting outputs and it pushes them to Git as well. So in this case, it's taking uh, the result of building something and it takes a manifest. And the unikernel is a megabyte in size, so it just pushes it to Git as well. It's just like a slightly bigger source file. Um, and then the result is completely tracked in Git. So in this case, we have the Mirage deployment website. And you can see here that 10 hours ago, I did an update of the, uh, the website. And the, this contains the complete configuration of the unikernel and the complete set of packages that went into it. Every package that is, it went into it is there. And it also contains uh, the unikernel itself. So in this case, if I go to, uh, for example, uh, the latest commit and I view, I browse the code, you can see here, oops, let me just go to, I'll go to random one. In this case, we also have the unikernel committed here and it's 2.5 megabytes. Why is it so big? because it contains all of the HTML, everything compiled into itself. All of the images that go into the live website when you go to openmirage.org. So all of this code is in there. So this is just an example of how you can build these beautifully, uh, pure, purely functional systems that, uh, that just track uh, everything that's going on. I've lost my slide deck now, sorry about that. So the implications of this are huge, because it means that we can not only take unikernels, 
uh, we can track their entire provenance using the normal tools that we use um, in, in Git. So in this case, we can use Git tag, Git log, uh, to track all of their deployments, and also Git bisect in order to go back in time and find bugs. So if you take a normal distribution, you have none of these benefits because of, um, uh, it's just because of the, um, the fact that we have a package manager to track everything. You can also do extremely low latency security updates because now we have um, the ability to do a git pull. Um, you don't have to wait for Apple or Linux to do a binary patch of Heartbleed. You simply push the source code update and every unikernel deploys itself. We've closed the loop with source code uh, just by running a little bit of functional code that will go off and, uh, and, and build everything. And remember, along with all of this, we also have the static type checking that me means that low-level bugs are out there as well. So really trying to build in uh, security as part of the, uh, the architecture of, of the whole thing. So this is you know, a bit of whirlwind tour. I just wanted to give you a sense of, uh, of many of the, the bits and pieces that are happening here. There was, there's one other little, little thing I wanted to show you, which is um, we've taken the Git database. And what we've done with that is that we've made it such that uh, we built it into the storage system that Mirage itself uses. And this is a Zen tool stack with two things. On the left, you have a snapshot of all of the active jobs that Zen is doing. On the right, um, you actually have Git. And this is the Git interface showing you um, what the Zen tool stack is doing when it boots uh, around 1,000 virtual machines. And the interesting thing here is that we, we ported the Zen tool stack to use Git. So this means that instead of, um, instead of having to debug it with printfs, we can just use Git to figure out exactly what's going on. And this means that uh, the, the base storage for unikernels is now using a database called Ermin that does not require um, any knowledge of uh, Git itself, but it lets you program against it in, in that style. And this is something I can uh, demonstrate later on. So it's incredibly exciting that we've taken the experiences from using Git and we've built that into the programming model. So we don't have file systems in unikernels anymore. We have Git, and we just use it everywhere. And similarly, if you go to Dexter or OpenBarge.org, we can see lots and lots of um, interesting ongoing uh, uh, bits and pieces of profiling and interaction with other code as well. One of the things I really wanted to point out, there's so much effort from the community now to building uh, real services such as IMAP and XMPP. So Hannes Benhart, uh, again from Berlin, has built an XMPP client for chat uh, using, uh, using, using Mirage. So it's really, really nice to see, uh, see that all of this is going on. And again, a bunch of interesting research projects that, uh, uh, that form a really good basis for experimenting operating systems. But the most important thing is that the reason we're doing this is because we're building an app store for our personal cloud. And it's called MyMod. And so what we really want to do is we want to take a lot of these protocols that you've seen, and our goal for this year is to glue them together into a system where you can deploy an ARM box and have your own email, your own file sharing, and your own location sharing handled on your own infrastructure. And by pulling this off, we, we can use the benefits of unikernels. We don't all have to become sysadmins. We might be sysadmins, but my parents are not sysadmins. They, will, they keep phoning me. Uh, and ask me to fix their, their code. And so the idea here is that these boxes will become something that uh, retains control in a, in a much, much more structured way. So hopefully, uh, we can use this in order to, to push unicorns and benefits out to the, uh, to, the, uh, to the outside world. And finally, it's all open source, of course. So I'd love for anyone to get involved. We've got a lot of Haskell hackers here. There's a unicorn called HalVM in Haskell. Uh, it's almost as good as Mirage. Uh, I'm, I'm very good friends with them. Uh, but the, uh, the, the, the beautiful thing is that there's no uh, hiding behind performance arguments. If you have a performance argument, you just benchmark it for a real protocol. So uh, it's just, uh, both of the projects need contributors to help with uh, protocol implementation and so on. We feel this is an extremely important thing to do for, uh, for uh, the ongoing um, uh, uh, health of the internet because these unikernels uh, are in their early stages despite years of work and now it really takes the community to come behind to build, uh, build the protocols and help out. So if you have a favorite protocol that you want to build, uh, Hannah's uh, built TLS, along with Debbie, there's many others, uh, please do go to OpenVarage.org and join our mailing list and so on and so forth. And there's hopefully lots of information online for, uh, to, to give you some uh, more information about that. So I hope you've uh, enjoyed this uh, tour through Unicorns. I'd love to answer any questions. I'll be around all day uh, and uh, uh, for uh, beer and wine afterwards to have a chat. So thank you very much. So, Amir, um, building is only half the story. How do you test it? That's a great question. Um, so part of the, uh, the nice thing about the module abstractions is that we can replace the real implementations with functional ones. 
So uh, Harris Roxos, one of the grad students in Cambridge, uh, built an NS3 version, a network simulator version of Mirage. So what that does is that instead of um, building it against a real network stack, it links it into the network simulator, and then this builds a network topology and it uh, tests failures and non-determinism and so on. So we can again use the functional aspect of things to insert those stacks. Now, the testing is one component that has not been maintained in Mirage. We built it as a as a driver, and it's actually one of the things that we actually need some uh, input on as well, because there's so many ways to test code, so, but we have the hooks to test it. Uh, now we're just waiting for the right uh, testing infrastructure to pull it off. So network testing and storage testing is, is a hot topic. It's also where open source is not great. So NS3 is not a good network simulator. So anyone, if anyone has any suggestions for good solid infrastructure to talk into that, I'd love to hear about that. One question um, regarding deployment, basically. Um, so I do a lot of deployments on the Amazon EC2 cloud, and that happens to run on Zen, as far as I know. Um, is there any effort, um, either at Amazon or elsewhere, to, to make it possible to have these on-demand bootable unikernels happen in the EC2 cloud? Uh, so that's interesting. So you can already boot uh, unikernels on Amazon right now, but uh, they're normal kernels. So. Uh, but in terms of on-demand, uh, this is very early work. We've, we're still upstreaming the patches to Zen, and this, uh, we've touched almost every part of the stack. So um, we are, we're open sourcing it, and we're actually thinking of putting together a service that will do this, um, just you know, to, to, while the cloud providers catch up. It's quite difficult for cloud providers to catch up, though, because Amazon charges by the hour. So we want to charge by the millisecond. It's, it's, uh, there's several orders of magnitude there to make, the, to make that different. So, um, it's not clear if the economics of the existing cloud providers will survive you know, the unicorn model, because their margins come from a lot of that. So, but you know, the patches are open source, and services will emerge in this year to, to make that possible. Thanks. Uh, operating systems are usually used to control your uh, your resources, and right. you uh, uh, <coughs> shown us how to nicely do this to, to uh, control your uh, devices and have great components for that. How about uh, your CPU? And are there possibilities to have different uh, scheduled uh, uh, policies, for example? Uh, yes, there is. So I didn't talk about this in, in this talk, but the, the threading system is also just uh, is written in our camel. So it uses uh, <coughs> uh, uh, an external library called LWT, which is lightweight threading. And what that does is that it, uh, it forces within the unikernel every thread to, to yield within cooperation. So our, our thread model is that we trust all code inside the kernel and none of the code outside the kernel. So uh, for, we, we actually have different schedulers for different purposes. So if you build a database, for example, we try to prioritize the, the, uh, the disk thread just to make sure that uh, we service uh, I.O. as quickly as possible. So this is just a matter of swapping out a small bit of source code uh, inside inside one particular library, so this is entirely possible. Um, the the thing with existing operating systems is that they have multiple schedulers layered on top of each other. So in Linux, you have thread scheduling, then you have process scheduling, then you have send scheduling underneath, and each of these do not cooperate. So this is what leads to inefficiency. So in especially on ARM, we have only one scheduler running, which is the Zen scheduler. Then the unikernel is put in a CPU, and it can decide how to multiply its own time internally. So it's much more efficient. Um, one of the recent uh, advances is that uh, this stuff is now being put into cars. It's a little bit scary, but there's two major German car manufacturers who've been looking into Zen on ARM for this reason, and they've ported real-time operating system support as well. So at, at FOSDEM next week, there'll be a big uh, group talking about this. So uh, unikernels are a perfect fit for real-time operating systems because you can run the RTOS thread, then schedule unikernel, and Zen supports you know, both of those, those models just right. So uh, it's, it's an exciting time to be thinking about scheduling, and it's got really good support for that. Thank you. Thanks, Anil. Um, you'll hang out, so you have the opportunity to ask him many questions later. We'll try to set him up in the small conference room at 3.30 after the last tutorial there, where we have a little bit of network infrastructure, where you can probably demo stuff. So if you, you want to um, ask him then, and you don't see him during the day, to the little conference room number three, probably at 3.30. Perfect. Or have your afterwards. Yeah. So thank you again, Anina. Um, yeah.